This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you. And special thanks to High Tech Oki, Jim Hart, and Logan Larson. Coming up today on DTNS, Discord's making some username changes. You might like them, you might not. Shopify's dropping logistics because logistics are hard. And let's go in flight. Mach 9, maybe, someday. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May the 4th, 2023. In a studio Redwood far, far away, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm rocking Rich Straffolino. That's no moon. It's me, Justin Robert Young from Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm uh, the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, come on, Roger. After all that. Oh, okay. Uh, I get to remake this movie two times, and I'm the show's (laughs) producer, Roger Chang. (laughs) Love it. Yep. Well, if you're a a fourth fan, you know what he means. Uh, Without further ado, let's get into some tech stories, starting with the quick hits. Anyone who uses the Bing browser with a Microsoft account can now use its chatbot powered by GPT-4. Bing Chat launched in private preview back in February. Some of us have played around with it, but everybody can now. Starting today, you can also pull image and video results, persistent chat history, and plugin support. One example would be making a dinner reservation with OpenTable. Browser plugin, Bing Chat can say, okay, I'm completing your booking. We can expect more announcements during Microsoft's Build conference, which starts on May 23rd. Mozilla announced a private beta for Mozilla.social, its Mastodon instance, although there is a wait list to join right now, uh, so you can sign up if you'd like to. In the announcement, Chief Product Officer Steve Teixeira said the instance will use content moderation based on its Mozilla manifesto. This emphasizes things like human dignity, inclusion, security, individual expression, and collaboration, saying that it's not trying to build a, quote, neutral platform. Teixeira also said areas like onboarding, discovery, identity, and monetization are ripe for experimentation on Mastodon. Of course, this uh, isn't the first go around for an instance from a browser company. Vivaldi Social launched back in November. If you're into GitHub's Copilot, but you don't want to part with the monthly fee or even in the annual fee, Hugging Face and ServiceNow Research are offering up an alternative. StarCoder is a code generating system available on a free OpenRail M license. StarCoder was trained on more than 80 programming languages and integrates with Microsoft's Visual Studio Code code editor. Well, Waymo has been operating in the Phoenix area for some time now, and now it's doubling the size of its autonomous taxi service area in the city to around 180 square miles. And it's also adding a back, uh, excuse me, a pickup spot at the airport. Waymo also expanded its San Francisco service area to cover the entire city 24 hours, seven days a week for service. Yeah, if anybody has tried either of these out and have thoughts, uh, you know, we welcome your feedback. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Germany's Infineon now officially operates a chip manufacturing plant in Dresden six months after it announced that the project would begin. Infineon expects production to start in 2026, so there's a bit of a ramp-up period, but that's what they're doing. U.S.-based Wolfspeed also plans to build plants in Germany. The plants are part of the EU Chips Act. That aims to increase manufacturing capacity inside Europe overall. Those are the quick hits. Now let's talk about one of the big stories today that has either either ruffled your feathers or you're kind of saying, what's the big deal? So Discord is changing how it assigns usernames, meaning that all existing users will have to get a new username. This isn't happening today, but it's happening in a rollout situation depending on when you signed up for Discord. If you're an early adopter, you probably get this uh, opportunity first. Now, the company previously let you choose a name, for example, minus Sarah Lane, then it added a four digit number to the end. That way multiple people could have that same handle. Maybe there are a lot of Sarah Lanes. Those numbers keep the accounts unique. So, Rich, I'm Sarah Lane, one, two, three, four. That's not exactly what it is, but you get the idea. There's a four numerical digit thing after my name. But that's been okay for me so far. So what's changing? Yeah, here's the skinny. Your current name will be replaced with an at symbol, followed by, you know, whatever username you end up choosing. No four digit number added to it. 
That also means your preferred username may not be available when you, they finally get around to ask you to change it. Discord will notify users when they can choose their new username, starting with users who have been on the platform the longest, so uh, the OGs get their due. The old username with the four-digit number will, though, still work as an alias, so you're not totally out in the cold if you're really wedded to your you know, four-digit uh, number at the end there. But Justin... Lots yeah. of people are having lots of feels about this. Uh, I'm curious, does this fire you up? It does not particularly fire me up, uh, although it might if I'm not able to get Justin R. Young, my preferred screen name on all platforms. What I would say by this is, number one, there is an immutable law of life that is particularly acute on the Internet, and that is the longer people stay in a thing, the less they like it to change. And this is going to change. And in some places there's a very real possibility that with more common nicknames, you won't be able to get the name for which you already have. The one thing that I think people should understand about this is that on Discord, yes, you had your username and that was the four digit code. That was how people would find you. But mm -hmm. in each Discord, you were able to change your display name. So that would be something right. that led to more memeable opportunities. The reality of it is Discord is prioritizing future users over current users. And the least popular that decision will ever be is right now when <laughs> there are very few future users and exclusively past you. Yeah, I saw, you know, sort of trying to figure out because uh, on the surface, when when I read the story this morning, I was like, all right, Discord says uh, it wants to just play a little bit more friendly with people who don't understand the username concept as it stands right now on various Discord servers, just uh, helping the normies a little bit more. Okay. A lot of people saying, you know what this is about? This is about, uh, you know, security and privacy. You've had, uh, you know, a lot of people who are uh, in uh, intimidating, uh, imitating uh, other users with similar usernames based on the fact that nobody was really paying attention to those four digits after, you know, the Sarah Lane one, two, three, four, you know, Sarah Lane five, six, seven, eight might say, I'm Sarah Lane one, two, three, four, and somebody could be duped. Uh, that's very possible. I'm not totally sure how this new policy helps us. It may crack down on that specific issue, but if I can't be Sarah Lane anymore, but I could still use my Sarah Lane 1234 alias with whatever username I end up being, with everybody that has become my community thus far on Discord, with new people, I guess it wouldn't matter, right? Because you just know what you know. Yeah. But for everybody else, you know, I can see where people are saying, why do this? Because at the end of the day, Discord is not a mass broadcast platform. Yes, there are Discords that have thousands of people in them, and I'm sure that Discord is planning for a, a reality where there are Discords with millions of people in them. Mm -hmm. But they are moderated based on how their communities are. I could change my alias right now in, the, in, in my own Discord and say that I'm Abe Lincoln. That does not mean that everybody <laughs> will believe that I am Abe Lincoln, who obviously sure. needs his own yeah. character. That would just be an alias. Yeah. Yeah. That, as that, long that, as you understand that we can say whatever, you know, that's not unlike what people do yeah. on Twitter. I mean, the, the, the reality here is that they want to give agency and permanence to these usernames. And right now they don't really have them. And I think that they were planning on scaling up this service in a way that that would matter less. Well, guess what? It matters a lot. And they are probably facing issues with verification and uh, uh, showing that certain people are certain people. Uh, they are growing beyond what they were before. So I, I get it as a decision. I also understand why people are really cheesed off, as I will be if I don't get Justin Hart. <laughs> anybody who works at Discord, please be aware. I will be mad, and I have a once-a-week platform. You know, by, by <laughs> spe speaking of all of this, uh, we we ended up um, uh, wanting to get a lot of thoughts from you, uh, many of our DTNS audience that is active in Discord. How do you feel? I want to read something, and I'm not going to say the username because I want them to get that username if that is uh, possible. But got, got a lot of feedback. Um, Rich and I were looking through this earlier, but but uh, someone said if I can't get my handle as my username, I'll feel incomplete in Discord. Sounds kind of petty, but this is actually a reason why I rarely use Twitch and Twitter. I don't like my usernames on those platforms. Every time I log in, it's a constant reminder. Now, sure, you could say that's silly. Just get used to it. 
Uh, but I'm with you, uh, person I will not name, because I want you to get your username. Uh, I, you know, I'm Sarah, I'm Sarah Lane on almost everything. But every so often, especially over the last couple of years, somebody beats me to it. So then I've got, you know, my second choice, third choice. It is not the end of the world. But it's just one thing that adds a slight complication to things. And I feel like, yeah, if you've, if you've been around Discord for a while, especially if you're paying for Nitro, and somebody scoops up your name and you're kind of like, what? okay, why am I paying exactly? I can see where this could, you know, you're going to get a lot of loyal people who aren't thrilled about the change. Uh, as, as, as was said on the wire, my name is my name. And, and I do think that, that that is a non-trivial issue on the Internet where we are able to create lives, relationships, cultures, clout. The fact that we can't track it to the name that we want is frustrating. The other thing that was really interesting to me in this whole announcement was Discord kind of being upfront about why the system kind of came about at all. And it, I, I mean, as someone who's just kind of a user of Discord fairly recently, um, just this whole idea, like their whole friend system was kind of added on after they had established these individual servers. And this is kind of a like a technical debt conversation where they just wanted to speed onboarding to servers at first and be like, we don't even care because it's going to be you and I don't know, 20 or 100 people. So probably username you know, uh, uh, you know, repeating usernames isn't that much of an issue. And then when they did the friend system, they had to be like, uh, there's 50,000 John Smiths or whatever. So yeah. we need to come out with a way to do that. And it's, it's, it's very rare. I feel like to get a company very, not one rolling out a, like a giant change like this in terms of everybody just has to pick new usernames, but acknowledging a, a technical debt and, and saying like, Hey, we need to kind of hit a reset button here for a lot of, for everybody so that we can kind of get beyond this. And, you know, maybe we have some other plans uh, down the road with, with how we're going to scale this platform or just to your point, really push the, uh, the size of uh, certain discord service and stuff. Well, moving on to science because science and tech, they uh, overlap every day and we loved the story so we wanted to share it with you because many of you are science focused and tell us every day that you like science stories on the show so thanks for that feedback scientists can't currently replicate what you or i see by just scanning our brains wouldn't that be nice well it depends on the scientist but <laughs> they're a step closer to being able to send impulses to our brains that could replicate visual stimulus so Jury, let's talk about this study. I'd love to, Sarah. Scientists recorded electrical impulses from neurons in the visual cortex in 50 mice while they watched a 30-second video clip nine times. They then trained a machine model called Zebra, that is pronounced Zebra, but it looks like Zebra because it starts with a C, to link the neural data to that video clip. When the mice watched the movie for the 10th time, the machine tried to predict the order of the frames in the clip that the mouse was seeing. It was able to predict the right frame within one second, 95% of the time. This does not let them recreate the clip by scanning the brain. However, it could reveal links that might allow visual sensations to be sent to the visual cortex of somebody with visual impairments. That's what yeah. that's what got me rich was okay interesting study of mice how does this help people uh looking ahead to anybody who has visual impairments who who might benefit from this that's where it kind of excited me Yeah definitely and what's what's also exciting is when you get into this paper, this uh, this paper was published in uh, the journal Nature, and it gets into a lot more of the use cases. This is obviously the one that is, it's the easiest to see, right? They can show the video of what the, the what uh, Zebra predicted that the, you know, what predicted based on their neurological reading, what they were seeing. And it looks remarkably similar. It's a little like glitched out uh, a little bit, like frame jumps a little bit, but you completely get the picture. You can completely see that they are accurately predicting what this movie looks like. But what's exciting about this is this whole system is is, is is much more general use. It's not just for this one application. So it can be, uh, it's designed to kind of uncover structures uh, and systems using behavioral and neural data. So 
uh, they also had use cases for like determining uh, like position of uh, of a body in space and stuff like that based on neurological readout, which is like mm. a really hard problem. And the other really encouraging thing, like just from a from a, a application for this, is a lot of times when you're talking about computer brain interfaces, right? When you're when you're having like trying to have someone's brain control uh, uh, like an artificial limb or something like that, that usually requires an individual training. Uh, to to get that all working and it's it's you can't just take aggregate data from everyone else and plug that in there what this system found though was that aggregating the data from those 50 mice improved they got that 95 percent because they used 50 mice when they mm -hmm. only used one mouse it was only about 50 or 75 percent um so this could it's potentially personal but, but but this could potentially allow us to like speed training down the road. Like obviously that's very far afield, but the idea that we can generalize this type of training uh, is very exciting and makes a lot of these systems a lot more immediately accessible potentially. Well, if you've got thoughts on this or anything that we talk about in the show and you say, you know what, I wish I had their email address so I could share my thoughts. Now's your time. Uh, you can email us at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and make your voice heard on anything we've talked about in a past show or might talk about on a future show. Thank you in advance. Well, you've definitely heard about the Ottawa-based e-commerce platform Shopify, and uh, they announced that, turns out, they're pretty good at making money, at least according to their quarterly earnings. In Q1, they made $1.51 billion. I'm sorry, they generated revenue of $1.51 billion. Uh, that beat analyst expectations, and gross merchandise volume was $49.6 billion, also beating projections. So everything looking good there. However, the company is making some changes. First, uh, doing job cuts, no big news here in the tech sector, cutting 2,000 jobs. That comes 10 months after the uh, previous round of 1,000 layoffs, so it's another significant chunk there. Arguably, though, the bigger news, it's selling the majority of its logistics business to the supply chain management company, Flexport. CEO Toby Lutke announced the layoffs in a memo to staff, adding that Shopify's numbers simply weren't healthy and reflect a trend in the tech industry overall. Kind of a big shift, though, for Shopify, right, Sarah? Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, Lutke uh, did not mince words, said this is this is the way it goes. Some of you will not uh, <laughs> be employed at Shopify as of today. But here is why. It's an about face for Shopify, which acquired shipping startup Deliver, that's Deliver with two R's, last year for $2.1 billion, we talked about it on the show, to better compete with oh, a little logistics unicorn called Amazon. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, you know, there are other companies, but Amazon's the one to beat, right? Amazon is the logistics company where everyone's trying to say, okay, how can we also do something, even at a smaller scale, but do it as nimbly um, and make money from it? Justin, sounds yeah. like logistics didn't end up adding up for Shopify, which does e-commerce very well and has for some time. What do you think about a brighter future for Flexport? If Shopify says, you know, we're just going back to e-commerce, that's what we do, logistics too hard, Flexport does logistics only, uh, maybe it's better to have two companies doing one thing well and work together in the future? A hundred percent. Number one, you cannot compare your web store to Amazon, especially when it comes to logistics. Amazon has spent the last 20 years building warehouses in strategic different places for which they can get things to you at a shocking speed. They are the greatest story of optimization and logistics of all time, and they are, they are a, a, a beneficiary of their own work in that regard. The question for Shopify is... Do you want to have your logistics done by them? And does Shopify want to operate and, and make efficient, a ruthlessly efficient game in selling logistics to the people that are on their platform? Right now, they do a great job of creating easy web forms, a reliable system, and a back end with uh, data that allows you with confidence to sell wares online. But there is a gigantic community of people that are competing for your business to fulfill those sales, including Amazon, by the way, you can, you can have your stuff shipped from an Amazon warehouse, even if it's not sold on Amazon, that is a service for which they also provide. It makes sense, especially if we're moving into a tech winter for Shopify to hoard their nuts and wait to see what happens going forward.
Yeah, I mean, on the surface, this all makes a lot of sense to me. It's Shopify said uh, in pandemic times, online shopping went through the roof. People were finding alternative ways to buy things. It's great. Let's hire and hire. Uh, this is not uh, this is not something that Shopify did on its own. This is an overall tech trend uh, that's happening for a variety of reasons. As the global economy self corrects, um, you know, there's 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 all sorts of uh, you know consumer spending that's down overall, whether it's in person or online. I mean, that also factors into this. But Rich, I know you were you got kind of fascinated with the story as you started digging okay. into the logistics business. Because every headline you're seeing about this in the tech press is this is a Shopify story. This is Shopify retreating from this you know very you know very big 2.1 billion dollar acquisition, their biggest acquisition ever. They're selling that off as part of this business. But what got me fascinated is looking at this. This is a big deal for Flexport, which is, if, if you've never heard of them, I didn't before today. That's because I'm not in logistics, but they provide like back-end freight and trade services. So mm -hmm. if, you're a, if you're a company and you need to know what ship your stuff's on or if it's going through customs or something like that, they have the back-end for that. But you know who their CEO is? Former Amazon Worldwide Commerce Chief Dave Clark, AKI, the guy that's been running their transport and logistics services for the last uh, several years, right? He mm -hmm. helped build these up to the mammoth that they are. And the fact that they're buying at part Deliver as well as Shopify's things, you know, Deliver is a much more uh, a closer to consumer service. So to me, it's not, it, yes, it's definitely as, as Shopify has said, this is us about finding our main quest as opposed to our side quest, very, very cutesy language that they are using there. But this to me feels like a much more significant expansion for Flexport led by uh, someone who definitely knows what they are doing. Obviously, they're not a new company, but that to me was what got me fascinated by this story of them getting closer to kind of not to, maybe not to consumers, but to smaller businesses and expanding out from this very back end freight stuff that they've been doing for the past uh, for, for almost a decade now. Uh, uh, j j just to give everybody a sense, when I was selling card games and we were selling them through Amazon, it's a fascinating process. You get a bunch of card games printed. They get them sent to your office. You then put them on pallets, and Amazon tells you, here are the three random warehouses that you are going to send them to. There is no rhyme. There is no reason. <laughs> you have no idea why or how. You just send it to those warehouses, and then those warehouses send it to other warehouses. So it is always two days away from anybody who is going to buy it. Their, their logistics are insane, have always been insane, and it's the reason why they've been able to, with very small margins, make money. Uh, uh, and that is a service that is dumb enough a caveman can use it, right? <laughs> like, like I, I could figure it out uh, uh, when, when we were selling our, our stupid card games. Here's the here's the other thing that just to think about what does Shopify lose in terms of what they can offer to customers with this, right? Obviously, they lose that kind of end to end thing, but the Shopify fulfillment network is still available to customers. Uh, Flexport is still going to operate the Shop Promise, you know, their two, their own two day shipping or next day shipping guarantee. So, like from a consumer perspective, you are not losing anything as a Shopify user by doing this. And Shopify also owns. It, they are saying high teens now percentage of Flexport. So if Flexport does really well and they're very focused on logistics, turns out Shopify is going to make money on that too. So like to me, this is, it feels more like a repositioning. I don't even want to say a, a withdrawal, just a, I guess a, a refocusing. I think, I think it's also the just them getting the money. Extract yeah. the money now, wait, go head to the Winchester and wait for this to all blow <laughs> up. Like, like that's, 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 all of this is about in tech right now. Well, speaking of tech, uh, if you'd like to fly at hypersonic speed and said, how do I do that? By the way, hypersonic <laughs> speed is defined as five times the speed of sound, so it's pretty fast. Houston-based aviation company Venus Aerospace hopes to give you your answer. The company has been building a hypersonic aircraft co concept, code word concept, very key here, called the Stargazer since back in 2020, that takes that hypersonic speed even further they're planning to carry about 12 passengers traveling at Mach 9, which is nine times the speed of sound. The Stargazer measures 100 feet long by 100 feet wide, is designed to travel 6,905 miles per hour at an altitude of 170,000 feet. This could make flying between, let's say, New York and Tokyo, which is actually something that uh, Venus Aer Aerospace uses as an example, 
a hour long flight rather than, I don't know, 16 to 20 hours, uh, depending on where you have to refuel and change planes. Now, if Venus Aerospace is successful, it blows away the last commercial supersonic jet that was the Concorde, which could travel at Mach 2 or about 1,535 miles per hour. You might also recall that Lockheed's SR-71 Blackbird traveled at Mach 3.2, 2,455 uh, 2, miles per hour. So this would be way faster, but still a concept at this point. I really regret that we're not going to be able to live to see a succession episode that is filmed in real time for the hour that the siblings take off from Tokyo and land in New York. <laughs> yeah. A lot of things happen in an airplane. Hey, yeah, just saying. This um, is, go ahead, Roger. This, this is an amazing concept. I, I would have never guessed that no one in the history of aviation has thought of doing something similar in the past 30, 35 years. <laughs> This is the thing. The technology in this, the uh, the, the rotating uh, pulse detonation engine, r uh, is a thing. And it's something that the, the military, specifically the Navy, has been looking into mm -hmm. as in a more efficient way to, to power surface vessels. Matt, if they got all the, say they get all the technology worked out, the biggest limiting factor, and this is why uh, supersonic travel has been so limited, and specifically to the Concorde, is uh, it's really expensive. And to make it business, to make a business case out of it, you got to charge people a lot of money, or you charge people a lot less, a lot of money, but char carry more of them at a time. Mm -hmm. And until you can do that, you're just going to be hemorrhaging money out. It's one thing to build this into a missile that blows up a big target. It's a different thing if you want to repeatedly send people from one end of the planet to the other in that one hour, and still say like have your budget in, 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 in the black at the end of it. Uh, I am, I am more bullish on some of the concepts of using rocket technology to get people mm. from New York to Tokyo in, in some ridiculously vanishingly small amount of time, mostly because we know all the tech there. It's literally just a, ma a matter of getting it cheaper. All right, Rich, let's check out the mailbag. Who's in it today? Well, we have a very exciting anonymous email, not the hacktivist group, just someone who didn't want us to use their name. Uh, they wrote in about our ongoing conversation about using AI tools inside a company that doesn't want you to use them. They wrote in and said, many orgs have extensive data loss protection or DLP tools that may detect if you try to move data to your personal device to then use AI language models. Please don't risk your job trying to use a tool your company as banned by sneaking data off to your personal device. They say, I'd hate to see someone lose a job over this. Uh, they said, our org has also temporarily banned AI language models and regularly detects insider accidental or malicious movement of confidential information. It's not fun for anyone involved. Mm -hmm. I know in, mm -hmm. all the insider threat stuff uh, is is one of the, the, the giant realms uh, within every company's uh, cybersecurity. So yeah, uh, they'll they, they, there's a good chance they'll find out if you're you're trying to do this. Just listen to them. Just just follow the yeah. rules. Right, look, look. Right now, the lead dog in AI is Chat GPT with OpenAI. OpenAI is not a secure platform in the way that you would want for something with personal data. Uh, uh, anything that you would not be fine appearing on the internet, uh, uh, be careful with it. And, and that is not a slag on OpenAI. They they are 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 upfront about the fact that this is not personal to you. Uh, I think we can all wait a little bit until there are more secure solutions for which your company can feel comfortable that they are uh, uh, burning their data through. And if anybody's catching up late to the story and saying, where, what is this in reference to? It started with a conversation we had a couple of days ago about Samsung saying, uh, we do not want you to use these tools. We had uh, another uh, mailbag uh, folk uh, write in and say, well, there are some workarounds, and I see those workarounds <laughs> happening all the time. Now, this latest one from a a Anon uh, is like, yeah, but depending on where you work, that company might uh, be putting a lot of effort into monitoring how you might use those workarounds. So, you know, just be careful. Be Not necessarily careful. one, you know, size-fits-all solution, but just be careful. Don't, don't go traipsing around chat GPT in this economy. <laughs> well, in this economy, uh, we really do want Justin Robert Young to continue with us because uh, because we couldn't do it without you, Jerry. So let folks know what else you're up to. 
our final episode of season three of World's Greatest Con comes out this weekend, and uh, we are going to answer all the questions that we've gotten in over the course of the season. And we have a big update, uh, something that actually came to light to us over the last week. It's a bit of a somber one, but uh, you can tune in to the finale. And now that means that the rest of the season is bingeable. Uh, episodes one through five, telling the tale of Project Alpha, two teenagers totally ended the world of rampant parapsychology research by pretending to be psychics, only to reveal that they were frauds on national television it's an, it's an amazing story from the first person perspective of the boys see you there world's greatest con everywhere you get podcasts can't wait to check that out and thanks to our brand new bosses just like the sith they come in twos we have rodney and abdullah both joining us on patreon thank you so much rodney thank you abdullah you Indeed. We are so happy every day that we get a new patron. If we get more than one, we're even happier yet. Speaking of patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. We are going to be talking about how Google chose to honor May the 4th today. The answer may surprise you. <laughs> but you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2800 UTC. DTNS, can, you can find out more about our live show options at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow with Shannon Morse, who just passed a YouTube milestone and is going to be bringing the knowledge to us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>